welcome to Western Civ. Today I sit down with historian Jacqueline Jones and talk about her most recent book, No Right to an Honest Living. The book takes a critical look at the Black experience in the city of Boston primarily, right before the Civil War to the decades afterwards. I like any sort of work of new historical research that does a nice job of complicating the narrative. This book does just that. It's hard to sometimes break away from how we see the past in terms of Boston equals abolition good, South equals slavery, which equals bad. Fact of the matter is, the story was a lot more complicated than that, as this interview will show. If you're interested in picking up a copy of the book, it's available today. All you have to do is click the link in the show notes, and it'll take you right to the page. So again, here with historian Jacqueline Jones here, talking about her most recent book, No Right to an Honest Living. Um, And, uh, you know, I'm always interested in books that do a nice job of complicating stories that are taught in an oversimplistic way, I think, in a lot of cases. And, you know, I call it a lot of times when I'm doing my teaching, you know, the the Disney version of history or the sort of black and white version of history, which has this strong tendency when you're talking about American and especially American antebellum history of doing the whole, you know, slavery is a southern problem and in the north everything is enlightened and specifically boston you know is this bastion of abolitionism and so on and so forth and what i love about the book is it does a great job of complicating that narrative in a way that i think is really important for us um so antebellum boston is is an interesting place and you point out it's a really complicated situation especially if we consider the freed men and the escaped um enslaved persons community so I thought maybe a start a good starting point would be to co- how does your book do a nice job of sort of complicating that narrative? Maybe you could expand on that. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, Boston did have a well earned reputation as being a center of radical abolitionism. Certainly, Frederick Douglass, Charles Lennox Remond, William Lloyd Garrison, William Philip, uh, William Wendell Phillips, and Theodore Parker. These are all real. Um, giants of the abolitionist movement, and Boston was, uh, for many of them, the center of their activity. But I think we need to remember the strength and reach of the conservative establishment in Boston. Um, Merchants, sea captains, textile factory owners all depended on cotton grown by enslaved people in the South. Uh, These Men and their families made a lot of money off of cotton, and they had a vested interest in the institution of slavery. I'll just add that Boston's political establishment was very conservative and tended to see abolitionists as troublemakers, radicals, and uh I think, were uh, pretty much pro-slavery. And that goes for the congregational clergy as well. The most prominent religious figures in the city seem to think that slavery was God-ordained and, again, that abolitionists were trying to upset the natural order of things. So one of the major points of the book is the strength of this pro-slavery establishment in Boston, and that certainly um, needs to be considered as we look at the, um, you know, the power and the outspokenness of the abolitionists. I will just say, too, that the abolitionists seem to be more numerous than they actually were. They were um, outspoken, they edited newspapers, they uh, protested, and um They seemed to be everywhere, and that's what gave them their power, although they were not very numerous, actually, in the city. So um, I just saw these conservatives as very invested in a slave economy, hostile to the anti-slavery forces in their city, 
And on top of that, the abolitionists themselves, I found, were indifferent to the well-being of their black neighbors. They seemed, the white abolitionists seemed to care more about the suffering slave in the South than their own neighbors there in Boston. So that, too, complicates the story. And actually, I begin the book with a quote from jo Dr. John S. Rock, who really lambasted white abolitionists for not taking into account the hardship faced by black Bostonians, and again, caring more for uh, the slaves in the South. Yeah, I do think it's important to draw a distinction between the concept of abolitionism and the concept of, you know, equal rights and opportunities for different freed peoples within the United States, because that they're not, you can't really put an equal sign between the two of those. And I think sometimes when folks um, oversimplify the narrative, that's what ends up happening. Um, and we have to pay attention that, you know, and there's also, I mean, there's a lot of different reform movements that are going on, you know, in the middle of the 19th century that are sort of some of whom ally to each other and with the expectation, of course, the women's suffrage movement is heating up around this time with the expectation that, you know, they're going to get um, women's suffrage as a result. It doesn't happen, um, you know, and so the abolition movement is tied to some of these different things, but it's not a it's not a civil rights organization per se. It's an anti, it's an anti-slavery organization. And one part of the book that I liked is when I was talking about the sheer number of enslaved, formerly enslaved fugitives, fugitive slaves who come to Boston really between 1850 and 1860 and how that kind of shakes up life there. And for those who are not familiar um, those who are in the international audience listening to this, you know, the United States goes, gets what's called the Compromise of 1850 um, in 1850. And one of the key aspects of this is, is a really revamped fugitive slave law that puts a lot of teeth in making sure that people who escape their terms of bondage in the South are able to be recaptured and returned. And oftentimes people who were not um, <laughs> enslaved people are um, erroneously uh, recaptured and returned to the South. So there is this sort of new dynamic that happens post-1850, but I was hoping maybe you could talk about how that 10-year peri ten period in history and the number of fugitive slaves who go to Boston starts to reshape the community there. I thought it was interesting. Yes, well, many of these fugitives, these freedom seekers, came from Virginia, and they came by sea. It was a complicated process. Uh, any uh, man or woman who wanted to make the journey had to save up some money to bribe various brokers um, at the point of uh, leaving. So there were brokers in Virginia, in Richmond, in Norfolk, who would help facilitate this process. Once on board ship, these fugitives had to usually grease the palms of the sailors and the sea captain <laughs> as well. And so it was kind of an expensive proposition to make the journey to begin with. Some arrived in Boston, though, with very little to their name, no, very little cash, very little in the way of personal belongings. And they were thrown into the Boston economy right away. Again, if we look at these white abolitionists, they're saying to these fugitives who have made a most traumatic journey, by the way, some of them hiding on board ship, many of them going without much to eat for the duration of the journey, which could take two weeks or so. Um, but many of these white abolitionists said, well, now that you're here, we really want to see if you can take care of yourself, not become a burden to the taxpayers of Boston. We want to make sure you can find a job and work. Uh, although really not helping <laughs> these men and women find jobs, not hiring them themselves. That was John S. Rock's complaint that many of these abolitionists didn't hire uh, black people in their counting houses, in their warehouses, in their uh, stores or shops. So, but in any case, the city of Boston did have what I call a fugitive economy, which depended on the labor 
of these freedom seekers and they added to the economy. Certainly the city of Boston, uh, parts of it became more radicalized as a result of several high pro profile renditions. That was the process, the formal process by which uh, fugitives would be sent back to their owners. And there were several of those in Boston uh, in the 1850s. And those um, renditions tended to be spectacles where the uh, a formerly enslaved person would be marched down to the wharf and forced onto a ship and sent back south that these renditions really gathered uh, or garnered the attention of thousands of people in Boston and, again, radicalized uh, certain um, parts of the city in the process. So we don't know the exact number of Fugitives in Boston at any one time, some came north to the city and then continued onward to Canada or to Western New York or the Midwest. Uh, but we do know that the fugitive business was a very lively one. Uh, once in Boston, certain people were paid to house and feed fugitives. They got money for that. Um, so again, there's there's money changing hands in this whole business, and it wasn't unusual on the streets of Boston to hear people with a Virginia drawl. These were uh, men and women who had come from that state to Boston and really um, permeated the economy, the political economy in meaningful ways, I think. Right, and you know, one of the things that you think about as you mentioned, having to stand on your own two feet and not be a burden to the, to the taxpayers of Boston. But one of the things that I think we forget is that some of these individuals who, are, who, who did escape, um, who, were a, who were in the minority, who were able to make it to Boston, nonetheless had you know, suffered through horrendous personal trauma. Um, layer upon layer of personal trauma. And in the book, you, you talk for a moment about, and this struck, this struck me because I had never thought about it before, um, you know, how does someone stand on their own two feet? How do you get a job? How do you start to create a living when you have suffered through levels of trauma that anyone in this country who hasn't served in the military probably cannot even begin to fathom? Um, how did they do it? I mean, what examples do we have? How do they, how do they manage to, to deal with it or not deal with it? Yes, well, for example, Anthony Burns, who was a famous um, fugitive who came from Richmond. He's a good uh, case study, I think. He worked on the docks. He earned his own money. He was supposed to give some of that money to his owner and to a broker as well, but he saved enough money to make the uh, trip aboard a ship in February of 1854. And when he arrived, he right away knew he had to find a job and make a living. And he um, made a connection with William Jones, who was a Boston worker, a black man, and Jones offered to take uh, Burns around. And it's a fascinating account of casual labor and how a newcomer to the city might look for a job going from place to place, from shop to shop, from um, house to house, asking for work, looking for work, finding piecemeal work here and there, a few hours washing windows, a few hours sweeping floors. Um, and it's fascinating to uh, see that process at work. Now, you mentioned the trauma. I mean, many of the people who came by ship had been uh, cramped into a hold, had been subjected to cold, to hunger on the trip. Uh, so physically, many of them were in really bad shape when they arrived in Boston. But even more significantly, I think many of them felt a great deal of anguish, guilt about leaving loved ones behind in Virginia or wherever they had come from, uh, wondering whether they could uh, buy those loved ones out of enslavement. And um, 
obviously having to rely on the goodwill of a handful of black people who had the resources in Boston to help them. So yes, it was very difficult. And what I have found was these white abolitionists, again, were very curious about whether fugitives could actually provide for themselves. You know, they consider this kind of an experiment, whether formerly enslaved people uh, had the initiative, the wherewithal, the resources, mentally and physically to find jobs and keep jobs. Uh, these white abolitionists not really understanding the trauma and the difficulties that these men and women faced. It seems... It seems so cavalier to kind of look back on it um, at the time, the way that they approached the situation, because it did seem like they were experimenting at, at a given moment. I mean, they they are going to have to sort of sell this idea of abolitionism and what well, what are 3.5 million people going to do, um, you know, after they're no longer, you know, being well being treated as property. Um, an interesting job that I had never heard of. Um, until I read your book, this was news to me, is the idea that anybody would make a living off being sort of an imposter, um, a, you know, a, a stand-in, I'm going to say runaway slave in, in quotation marks is a better, because I can't think of a better word off the top of my head. What, what is this and who did this and to what extent was this happening? Because I've never, I'd never heard of this before I read your book. Well, the book really is about making a living in all sorts of ways. And one way for a few people, at least in one way that was exclusive to people of African descent, was working as a fugitive imposter. And these are men and women who claim to have escaped from slavery, even though they had not. They were freeborn in the North, but they uh, began to solicit among abolitionists and other well-meaning people in Boston and other cities. So um, it is true that within this abolitionist network, uh, men and women who were fugitives could appear on stage at a rally or uh, an indignation meeting and um, it really garner the sympathy of those in attendance and at times make money. And sometimes this effort was much more informal, just kind of introducing when they introduced themselves to an anti-slavery person and said, uh, you know, I made this horrendous journey from the South and now I want to redeem my loved ones. I need to pay for my wife and children to come North and that's going to take a lot of money. And uh, the thing about the fugitive imposters is that they needed a really good story. <laughs> they needed a good narrative. They needed to be convincing. They needed to tell a tale, a harrowing tale um, of escape, uh, a journey to the north. I found one tale that was just so um, fantastical and really uh, was not to be believed. The chronology was all off, but this was a man who uh, felt he had a future ahead of him, convincing uh, abolitionists that he was a, a fugitive and, and tried to make money in the process. So, yeah, I mean, they're very uh, creative, these imposters. They're a subset of scammers, and there were obviously black as well as white scammers, con men and women, who had a tale to tell. It might have been that they were going to be starting a school or they were going to be uh, starting a mission somewhere. You know, any story that could elicit sympathy <laughs> from uh, white people, especially people of means. But the imposters, you know, were a category by themselves because it was a job, if we want to consider it a job, and I do, it was a job available to black people only. <laughs> And uh, it really depended upon their performative skills, I think. Yeah, it's really a unique um, occupation. I mean, it is. It's a job. You're getting paid to do it, um, you know, and it is, as you say, it turns out to be the only job um, that black people are, uh, the, the only job that, you know, you can only do it if you're black sort of a thing. And it's, and it's just, it's a fascinating 
look at what I mean, what of course would have been a very small subset of people. You know, this would not have been a lot of people. Well, and also, I, 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 uh, yes, it's a very small number. And also, you know, it's a very precarious livelihood. And they had to uh, move from town to town before they were discovered. Uh, Boston abolitionists thought they should, you know, send lawyers south to check out people's stories. Well, they couldn't do that for everybody. That was too expensive. But in any case, once people's credibility was questioned or once their credentials were exposed, <laughs> they had to move to the next place. And so it, it really did involve a great deal of uh, moving around. It wasn't a secure means of making a living by any measure. So how does the Civil War then um, impact Boston's black community? I mean, are they... I'm just, I'm curious to know, like, whether, you know, it improves situations for them, whether there's not really a change, whether it galvanizes Boston's abolitionists into um, trying to find more work for them, or whether um, it makes things more difficult in the long run. Well, certainly the Boston economy faltered there at the beginning of the war because trade was severely curtailed. So the docks fell silent. Some of the wealthy saw a decline in their livelihood. They had, uh, they couldn't afford to pay their domestic servants anymore. Some black men and women found themselves out of a job as a result. Some longshoremen did as well. The economy of the city picked up after a year or so with the uh, production of various goods and services for the Union Army. And yet black men and women didn't really um, didn't really prosper the way certain groups of whites did. For instance, the textile mills in Boston Centerland were really humming as they made uniforms for Union soldiers, and yet no black men or women uh, were hired by these factories. The uh, machine operative job was for white people exclusively. I do find, again, a great deal of creativity among black workers. There were brokers uh, who, uh, Jonas Rock worked as an attorney and he served as a lawyer for men who wanted deferments or for women who wanted to apply for public aid during the war. He made a living that way. He had been trained originally as a dentist, and then he became a physician. And right before the war, he became an attorney. And so he was able to, um, again, serve as a, a broker, a, a lawyer on behalf of these men and women who wanted to navigate the bureaucracy, the wartime bureaucracy. We have other people who are working to uh, bring migrants uh, from the South, even before the war is over, to work as domestic servants in, the, uh, in Boston homes and in parlors and kitchens. And they, they are able to uh, make a living, uh, a modest living that way as well. I also found a, a case of a man who was a broker for uh, black seamen who would pair uh, black sailors with ship captains during the war. So these are some examples of, again, uh, black people rising to the demands of uh, the wartime economy and uh, finding work accordingly. Yeah, it, it is worth noting, uh, and it, it, it's important to understand that, you know, as we talk about sort of complicating the narrative with the South being dependent on slave labor um, for its economy, that, you know, the North and Massachusetts and Boston was, you know, benefiting tremendously um, from extremely cheap cotton being produced, because that's what, of course, is driving the textile production um, in places like Massachusetts, which is, you know, the, the dominant engine of the Industrial Revolution, especially early on. And so, uh, yeah, and you do point out in the book, you know, like, there, there are a lot of black individuals who work on the docks in Boston, and that's, it's not a desirable position in a lot of ways, um, but the docks fall silent when there's not 
textiles to export anymore. And when there's not cotton coming in from the South, there's just not less of a demand. So it's one of those situations where you see, and this is a rinse and repeat for American history by and large, where, and I suppose worldwide as well, the, the workers who are sort of like on the bottom of the pyramid, those are the first people to suffer any time an economy goes through a transition, which is what happens in any sort of a wartime and happens here as well. Um, I thought I would then also ask, I, I, this shocked me. I didn't, this is another one of these things I had no idea. Um, you talk about the book, how there's these Confederate officers who are, are taken captive um, during the war and are, and are brought up to Massachusetts, you know, in a prisoner situation. But they have their servants, you know, they have enslaved people with them who come along with them. And I don't know how long that is the status quo, um, but the fact that they would be allowed to do it at all is in- incredible to me. Um, so I thought, could you tell us a little bit about that? That was just so strange. Well, certainly there was a certain amount of deference accorded Confederate officers by their Boston and Union counterparts. Uh, And these were uh, men who were incarcerated in Fort Warren in Boston Harbor and yet did have their enslaved servants with them. Um, How many? I'm not sure. There was a great deal of outrage, as there was a great deal of outrage when black men accompanied Union officers to the front and then were captured uh, by the Confederate forces and sold into slavery. And I should mention, too, as I'm talking about uh, jobs and the way the war affected black Bostonians, that, of course, we we do need to talk about military service as a kind of labor as well. In the book, I I look at... um, the job of soldiering, uh, the same way I would look at civilian jobs as, you know, what is the pay? What are the conditions? Who is the boss? What are the physical demands? And if we look at the military that way and not just as positions of honor and so forth, we can see that the military uh, really mirrors the civilian division of labor with black soldiers segregated into separate units uh, until very late in the war, they received lesser pay than their white counterparts. Too often they were relegated to fatigue labor, which was really arduous and led to all sorts of medical problems. So certainly we need to look at the way uh, the Union Army deployed black labor, both in the form of soldiering and in the form of laboring among uh, black men and women who were in refugee camps uh, near military encampments in the South. Yeah, it's interesting. I, and I, I wanted to ask, just going back to the um, to the Confederate officers who were able to keep some of their servants with them. I'm just curious, is this before or after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863? Because I'm kind of curious as to whether or not that seems like it should have stopped that, um, at least on its face. But maybe I'm wrong. Is it what what's our time frame? Do we know? No, I don't think we know much about these enslaved people and what and what happened to them. Um, it is a fascinating question, and again, we're not sure how many uh, black men were in this situation during the war. I will add that yes, I mean Boston had a complicated relationship to slavery. Uh, there were cases of owners before the war who brought enslaved people with them, you know, if they came to visit relatives or they came for the summer. And uh, abolitionists would say to these enslaved people, you know, you're on free soil now and you you don't have to leave with your owner when he or she goes back south. And they were surprised. They were really taken aback, these mainly white people, when uh, the black person said, no, well, no, I want to go back, not realizing... um, these whites didn't realize the importance of family life and why a black person might not stay in Boston where he or she knew no one uh, rather than go back home to loved ones. 
so that was one issue. And the other was I did find instances of Southerners who did move to Boston. They brought their enslaved workers with them, their servants, their cooks, who were no longer slaves once they were on Boston soil, but who um, were not paid anything. We're not paid anything. We're, we're basically treated as enslaved workers, nonetheless. I mean, they lived with the family, uh, but they did not receive cash wages for what they did. So, you know, there are all sorts of vestiges of slavery in Boston during this period, I would say. Yeah, and as, as there are in just about any major city, you know, that, that you would visit um, at the same, during the same time period. Well, certainly, you know, um, African Americans wanted to fight um, in the Civil War. You know, there was, there was efforts. I would suppose if I were to talk to any person in the United States today and I were to say, you know, well, what do you know about um, African Americans from Boston serving in, you know, the Civil War? They'd probably make some reference to the movie Glory at some point. I guess that that would probably be the most common <laughs> um, thing that I would get. Um, but that really was, you know... Getting to the front lines was really sort of the anomaly, wasn't it? And it was really the you know, African Americans toiled in dirt. You know, if we're talking about labor with reference to the war, we're talking about something that isn't fighting, isn't that right? Yes, and I should note that black people, black men from Boston fought in the 54th Massachusetts, an all black unit, as was the 55th Massachusetts. Regiment, and they also fought in the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry Unit. So these were the main uh, segregated units uh, that uh, Black Bostonians fought in. They desperately didn't want to fight for liberty, for themselves, for their families. What we find is, um, and certainly they served heroically at Fort Wagner, Fort Pillow, Honey Hill, there were uh, a number of engagements where black men were thrown in, usually in uh, engagements, engagements very poorly planned by their white officers, I should note, and, and engagements that resulted in a high rate of casualties. But once uh, in the South, many of these men were disappointed, to say the least, to find that they were relegated to fatigue work, which meant basically that they were setting up tents and in some cases, I, I found an instance where they were setting up tents for uh, white regiments who were then relieved of that arduous kind of labor. Uh, these black men were digging trenches, erecting fortifications and placing cannon. Uh, and again, many suffered from injuries. Um, I followed one young man, uh, Thomas Selden, through this, who s suffered a, a hernia from placing, helping to place a huge cannon on the Sea Islands of South Carolina in 1863. And this uh, fatigue labor really, or really helped white soldiers, I mean, it relieved them of that effort. And it was the source of a great deal of resentment among black soldiers. Again, they were not getting paid. They were getting um, uh, 7 or $8 a month instead of $13 a month that white men were getting. And often they were in service to white soldiers at the same time. And these men wrote in black newspapers and in letters home how deeply resentful they were of this situation. And they were also very worried that their low wages um, were not going to be able to support their wives and loved ones at home during the war. And I should note that they did not accept the lesser pay, men of the 54th and the 55th, um, for many months on, as a matter of principle, because they wanted to make a statement about how uh, degrading this was to them as men and as soldiers. So uh, what I found, though, is that there was not just a matter of principle involved, but a matter of the welfare of their families back home. So it's a, it is a complicated story, and it is one that the movie <laughs> Glory does not really tell us about uh, in all its complexity, I think.
Right, and it's a movie, so I suppose I should cut it some slack. But um, it's um, the other thing that you point out here that I think is really important is when you talk about doing fatigue labor compared to combat service. So when so when we talk about somebody who is moving cannons, digging trenches, setting up tents, compared to someone who is actively involved in service, uh, both of those two individuals can suffer major injuries. It's just that the one who's in combat, that injury is a lot easier to prove um, because it comes from the battlefield. And you do address this in the U.S. pension system. So I think it's important for us to, since we're on the subject, talk for a moment about how the U.S. pension system, which is supposed to be, you know, even, equal for for all veterans of the war turns out i suppose this won't shock anyone but but turns out not to be in many cases is that right yes there were several factors at work i mean as you point out the pension system was colorblind uh black veterans could apply for a pension just as white veterans could the problem that many black veterans face though actually many problems um, had to do with their poverty and with their uh, peripatetic uh, experiences. So in order to apply for a pension, usually one needed a lawyer to help file the paperwork, and many people could not uh, pay the, I think it was maybe $10 to, to get that done. Also, the paperwork itself was arduous and required all kinds of documentation that formerly enslaved uh, men might not have uh, access to and that even um, free men uh, had at times lost or misplaced in the process of moving. Certainly um, name changes were uh, a big problem when widows went to apply for widows' pensions. They at times recounted very complicated histories that the um, pension officials uh, uh, didn't uh, acknowledge or uh, kind of categorize as evidence of immorality. These might have been common law marriages, for example, or uh, uh, serial uh, marriages. It's, and, and often there was uh, the suspicion on the part of the pension officer that a black man might not be telling the truth, uh, that his injuries were not really, um, that they really didn't come from uh, the war at all, but from some other place, in which case the pension would be denied. I mean, there were many, many reasons for denying these men pensions, and uh, people would have to be persistent. They would have to file again. And again, so uh, I did find, again, that compared to white veterans, uh, black veterans did not receive pensions at the same rate. And we can certainly enumerate all those reasons. I thought it was interesting because you talk about the need to be persistent. You know, in the, in the book, and, and her name escapes me, but you recount the story of at least one widow who has to go back over and over and over again you know, and if she gets remarried and then that husband dies, then she has to go back and request the pension funds again and again. And, you know, each time you have to pay a fee and each time she has to go through this lengthy process, um, which, again, we have to remember, this is, you know, 3.5 million people who have been denied any education opportunities, you know, for hundreds of years. So there's it's not. It's not as simple. It's not as cut and dry as to say, like, well, it's a, uh, it's it's a race neutral policy on its face. So therefore, it's race neutral, and we can go on our ways. Um, and you know, getting to that question of sort of how this has sort of a long term impact. Um, you know, reading some of the latter chapters of the book, which we're talking about, sort of how you know the black community in Boston gets shuttled into certain careers over time and those careers almost to me start to start to resemble a hereditary caste system at some point where it's difficult to to move out but it was i thought you could just talk for a moment about 
you know, how father and son wind up having this, the same traits over and over again. It's very difficult to sort of break out from that. Well, it's clear that the uh, lack of, uh, the relative lack of home ownership on the part of uh, black men and women in Boston is a key factor here. These are men and women who work at menial jobs. Uh, Their children, as you point out, will work at the same menial jobs, and there is no real upward ladder of mobility for these community members. That means they can't accumulate the assets that will allow them to buy homes and pass those assets uh, down to future generations. And, you know, the fact that there were um, uh, several groups of potential white allies that failed to come through for black workers, um, city officials who knew that Black people were taxpayers um, because um, household belongings were taxed as well as real property. So one need not own a home in order to pay taxes if one had furniture, uh, for instance. So these uh, men and women often were taxpayers, and yet they did not get the public works jobs that the city of Boston began to fund really during the war in a serious way. Those jobs went exclusively to white men and mostly to immigrants as well as uh, a way of kind of to cement their politically political loyalty to, uh, to officials in Boston. There are all sorts of groups that we might have thought that white veterans would have uh, served as advocates for their black counterparts. That was not the case. Uh, Republicans uh, doled out a few jobs for a favored uh, few uh, black men during this period, work in the customs house for the postal service, uh, but by and large did not uh, argue for integrated workplaces at all. And I think this is significant because um, these white Republicans understood that if they did push for integrated workplaces, they risked alienating uh, white supporters. So they refrained from doing that. The point is that by 1900, the social division of labor in Boston, in terms of its racial dimension at least, is pretty much the way it was in 1850 or so, with black men working as porters, Tenders, tenders are kind of uh, all around uh, menial laborers, custodians, that sort of thing. The women are laundresses, uh, and there are no women uh, working in retail sales or as clerical workers. Uh, there are no men or work women working as factory operatives. And uh, this does have uh, a, a kind of cumulative and self-fulfilling effect where um, factory owners say, well, you know, black people can't work machines. I, I haven't seen a black person uh, in a factory, so therefore I assume that, you know, uh, they can't work machines when in fact uh, for generations they have been shunned as uh, possible factory workers. So again, I, I conclude the book in 1900, but not much has changed in the last 60 or 70 years at that point. And that is notable, I think, given the changes in the Boston economy, the rise of a retail and um, clerical sector, for instance, the uh, trauma of the Civil War with the death of 750,000 people, you would think, again, that there would be some major changes in the social division of labor, but there really aren't in the city of Boston. Yeah, and you just kind of have to, it is remarkable, because if you just look at the difference between, let's say, two groups who emigrate to Boston around roughly the same time, because, you know, in the 1850s, you have a not insignificant number of black Americans arriving from the South, and you also have a lot of um, immigration from Ireland. Um, And over 50, that 50-year period, you know, you look at those same families and the the Irish ones are doing significantly better. They have gotten, the Democratic Party has really sort of taken over by the time we get to the late 19th century. And, you know, they've reaped the patronage spoils from that, and I'm an Irish, 
uh, immigrant descendants. So, you know, I, I guess I got the benefit of that um, to some extent. And But you're right. By 1900, the picture for most black Bostonians looks exactly like it did in 1850. Um, and that's one of those things that it's just, it's a, again, it's an important takeaway. Well, um, we're running out of time here, but I, I just wanted, I always, I always end by asking, um, did I miss any? I mean, it's a wonderful book. We talked about a, a fraction of it, an, an absolute fraction of it for those who are listening. Um, but I, I should ask, is there anything else that you think we should know? Well, I think that the, your listeners should know that the book is not just about barriers to jobs for black men and women. It's also about the resourcefulness and the creativity these men and women showed in making a living and ways they were able to provide for themselves through mutual aid associations, through uh, cr creative ways of uh, earning a living and so forth. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's a very complicated story. And yet the, uh, the barriers erected by white employers, the prejudices of white people are not the, uh, not the whole story here. Right. There's always two sides to the coin because there is the, you know, there's the side of all the obstacles, but then there is the tremendously positive side of those who are able to, against all odds, miraculously overcome them. And that's, that's the story of the American dream, I suppose, to a large extent. Um, but thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. It's, it's been lovely, and it's, it's a wonderfully written book. I'm, I'm sure it's going to do very thank well. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. And that concludes my interview with historian Jacqueline Jones and her most recent book, No Right to an Honest Living. It's a very well-written book. I recommend it. The link is in the show notes. If you'd like to pick it up, on Friday, we resume the narrative. As always, if you're interested in any extra content, check out the website link in the show notes, as well as the links to ad-free shows and Western Civ 2.0, which is really starting to take off, and I couldn't be happier. Until Friday. Until Friday.